So I um I I started doing my activism and food not bombs and I mean I should say my my service work. There was activism as well. I don't know if people remember the Mayor Jordan, Jordan days, but it was kind of mellow in people's park. Um, but I, 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 um, and I also worked at the Long Hall Info Shop. And um, Needle Exchange was, was like in the same mayu, but I would hear about it from kind of different people. I, I definitely heard about it from David, um, who was my bandmate at the time. Um, we actually lost a bandmate to overdose, and that was the first time I remember, like, losing somebody my age. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit... I'm actually pretty emotional about the whole excitement of the develop... hearing David's history, too, so, um, forgive me for <laughs> emotional. Um, anyway, um, and Josh Levine was somebody also that, that put out a call for people to, to uh, volunteer at Needle Exchange. We would play punk soccer with them at uh, Ohlone Park after Food Not Bombs um, on Mondays. This was the early 90s. And then I went to Portland to go to college, and after college I bought a car and um, drove around the country. And when I got to New Orleans, there, uh, or I coordinated with, uh, to, to arrive at New Orleans during the Drug Policy Foundation Conference of 97. And David was there, John L. was there, and I also met Britta Nelson, who was the then um, volunteer coordinator, and crashed the conference. I met this really amazing woman named Dana, also um, her name was Sheila O'Shea, and she was, she told me she was presenting on like drug, what drug users can do to help other drug users and to help themselves and to, you know, to make healthy choices, and I was like, I dropped, but I was like pretty inspired by that um, because it hadn't really been the language of. I mean, certainly, like it certainly fit in with like how we approached food not bombs. Food not bombs was not supposed to be something like by some people and for other people. It was very much like everybody's hungry, right? So we all, we you know, like anybody could participate on any level, like whether you're receiving services or or giving them. It wasn't there wasn't this strict division and. It, you know, with, um, with, I sort of had this idea about needle exchange that it was more, that it was less horizontal in that way, or, or that was more, there was more of a division, and, like, that was really inspiring to me that she kind of was, was pushing this, um, this agenda, or, what, or this, this concept of, of drug user empowerment, and, um, so I started, I, I moved back to, uh, Berkeley or Oakland actually and um, moved in with Britta. First I stayed with you for a little bit and definitely it would like just made sense. I was looking for you know where to do volunteer work and um, was very interested in HIV prevention and started um, volunteering with Needle Exchange and for a long time I, I was just kind of a you know I don't think I was I definitely there was no arresting going on, and so there, there was no, um, it, it didn't feel super challenging in that way. Like, I, I, I'm kind of challenged by being arrested. I, don't, I, I really admire people that, that um, get arrested, to, like, on a regular basis or, like, for really are willing to do that for movements. And I, you know, like, at the time, it was kind of in, in this zone of, like, you, you just kind of like put a lot of needles in bags we didn't have, we just like counting needles sitting in the van and counting to 10 and um just trying to not distract yourself and I also um well in 2000 I, I also started working for SFNE San Francisco Needle Exchange which is the youth exchange at Hay Street um now it's called Homeless Youth or this, there's another iteration called Homeless Youth Alliance and um, that was, so I was reading really both and getting to like exchange ideas a little bit. They were, they were, um, more limited funding wise than we are and, and staff wise. And we were kind of small then too. We were, there was in, in 99, 2000, there was probably like a core 10 of us, if that. Um, and I, I learned... I, I remember one thing that was it was pretty significant at the time was that you would 
at, at SFNE, I learned there were there was a lot more um, kind of closeness between the, or it seemed like, I, um, it seemed like there was a lot of closeness. I think because it was a, largely a youth program, there was kind of like people wanted to take the youth under their wings a little bit. And there, so the, and it was just a really small space that we would do an exchange in. Um, and also, they were giving away muscle rigs, and we're talking about safer muscling as opposed to skin popping, and that was um, so a safety thing that I was able to bring back to need. We started carrying muscle needles and like teaching people about not about like the comparative advantage of for infection reasons, the comparative advantage of muscling. Um, also in 2000, um, David encouraged me to go to the overdose conference that Philip Coffin or helped to organize and really find out about naloxone, which also nar known as Narcan. Um, the, and, and that's the overdose reversal drug, probably all of you are familiar with um, its properties, but it, it um, it w you were really good about encouraging me to go and, and take a good notes. And as a side note, I decided to go to film school for a minute and make a movie about things that I was thinking about. But, <laughs> but it was kind of like, I never finished the movie, but I, I, it, it definitely like shifted me more into gear of like all of a sudden all of the, my life was, there was, there was this plot that involved, um, you know, like drug users and then that I was working on and filming it. And then I, I had like drug users in my cast and, and, um, and, and then I was working for two needle exchanges and then I started working for urban health study and I was, um, so gradually that year and then the following year, 2001, I, I joined HEPTEV at, which is the hepatitis education and um, train and testing and vaccination um, project at or it's the section at the Berkeley Free Clinic. So I was juggling like it was just became really this this uh, um, like whole life project of of working with a similar population and um, and really trying trying to really plug people in, you know, and saying like, oh, you need these services? Okay, like, so you should um, meet me here and then I can direct you to, you know what I mean? Like trying to be this juggling all these um, things. And, and, I, and I, I, um, I, what I was doing at Urban Health Study at first was interviewing people, uh, like the, part of the main study, which was just to gather a bunch of behavioral data and test people for HIV. Um, and then uh, I got hired to be one of the first coordinators of what was called the CALCEP study. And the CALCEP study was a study of um, the different needle exchanges throughout California. It was, it was comparing all of them um, and taking um, program attribute data and interviewing the staff, interviewing um, key clients and getting people's HIV status. So I was doing HIV testing and I was, um, and we really, we, you know, they, they did it so that um, I would go study the, the, I would, I would do the interviews at other programs and then some, you know, to avoid conflict of interest, some other people would, while I wasn't at need site, I, they would send people out to, to need site and, and do test our people and um and so same same i was working for alex crawl and ricky bluthenhall was also um at that time with rand in la and he was he was one of the lead researchers um on that and uh rachel anderson was the other pi from sacramento and um need came out really um by by this time Need had adopted a, a distribution model, meaning that like we would give away up to 500 and didn't didn't depend on how many dirty meters you would bring in. Um, you could get, um, you know, and and 
we didn't anticipate that like that we would be like researched on this but we came out like the results were that in fact if the the programs that were giving away needles and we were one of the few that were not a one for one or one for one up to 10 um up to the nearest like 10 um we we were we were one of the few doing distribution and that the that the distribution model syringe exchanges were like the clients or as we call them participants but the clients were reporting less sharing less and um and i think the burden of hiv was also lower but there's also other factors with hiv because obviously it's transmitted through other things besides needle sharing and um so that was that was really encouraging. I I um, only worked for that study for about a year, um, and then transitioned into becoming um, the overdose uh, the outreach and overdose prevention coordinator for Need, and that was in the days of when there was a stipend for five coordinators. It was me, Britta. No, Britta had left, right? Do you remember? <laughs> this was <laughs> me, Peter Geister was um, somebody from Fresno who came and I, I have pictures. If you, if, if I ever, Peter's right here. This is us at um, the Hearst site when it used to be on the south side of the street. Um, Jenna Grant is featured. Um, I'm happy to pass this around. This is Russell, who's from the GMHC at the Berkeley Street Clinic, but also drove our van for a while. And um, so, yeah, so it was me, Peter, John L. was coordinating food and ser serving, do, doing kind of a Food Not Bomb style, like serving of cheese board pizza and stuff at sites, which was very popular. Um, and uh, David, were you a coordinator at that point? <laughs> That was never like, who was else was the other three the, the other two coordinators? It was um, Carmen Landau was our wound care coordinator. Um, and that was that was based on like a focus group or a couple focus groups that that um, David and Amy um, held that to that discovered that really like what one of the things that was needed, there was a couple things needed, but one was overdose prevention, which we were finding out about, and then um, wound care was really something that, that was needed. And, and so the, that van that, that we got, which is pictured, sort of, pictured in a number of these slides. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, there, it had supplies in the front where the driver was, and then a wound care clinic in the back. And that was where we, or Carmen, um, who, um, got trained, I think her mother was a nurse, and she got trained and like was doing pretty awesome work. She was very popular, and people really had really great things to say about her. And I started, um, I had kind of put together like, what is, oh, I, I also put together this guy. This is the drug interaction manual that I did in 2000, and it, um, it talks, it talks about Prescription drug interactions with street drugs, and I had to kind of give myself. I'm not medically trained, like, or I, I, my I was humanities person, history major, in um, college, and like, so I kind of had to read a lot of, you know, figure out what was meant in these um, medical journal articles about, and 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 it was it was kind of like going to journal articles and then getting. Emmanuel Sparius kind of turned me on to what, what was a very serious drug interaction between um, ritonavir, which is an HIV medication, and, um, and ecstasy, which uh, people were dying from it. Um, so that's, that's, there's, that's one of the central drug interactions that's kind of serious. I don't actually remember all the, the drug interactions, or I have to refer to it myself. Um, but... Um, the, the impetus for that, for this manual came from, it was one of Chuck's friends was at Needle Exchange just like one night and was talking about, yeah, it was, it was somebody that was in recovery with Chuck and um, he, was, he was like, yeah, I just got put on Paxil and he was kind of 
trying to figure out how heroin would, or methadone maybe, um, would would interact with the Paxil that he that he was had just gone on. And I started thinking about like drug interactions and like what while like there's no information and people really don't are kind of playing with fire maybe or or maybe just know more than medical professionals and so I, I I felt like I I wanted to put something like I had been wanting to put it together for like a year and a half basically and Pete Morse was like hey let's there's a conference coming up like let's submit an abstract and then we were gonna do it together and then he got of just like he kind of went his own way and I um, did the research and um, put and wrote it and it like there's typos in the thing because I was putting it together at the last minute um, this is one and two copies, so I definitely want to make sure. Like, <laughs> um, there's it's online as well, but there's but there's only like a couple of original copies, so I want to get it back. But um, the uh, and and then the the naloxone program, I guess there was probably some naloxone in the mix before 2001 or 2002, but. That that was when we sort of officially I was I had consulted with Philip Coffin and Dan Chigroni and Dan Big and um, and other people that were Ro Giuliano from SFNE and and people that knew about naloxone there weren't that many people but there were there was they were available for you know really really made themselves available for like talking and I I really just wanted to make sure like we weren't doing any harm. With, by, by giving you know distributing naloxone in the community, and it it it, it really it we were kind of some of the people that were f first doing it. And, um, it's now making a lot of headlines. It's now become becoming kind of standard practice in needle exchanges, and in fact, certain especially red states like they are approving naloxone distribution, and they're not approving needle exchange. So it's kind of it's kind of an interesting, like the the whole, I guess, yes. you know, there's 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 a whole political side and, and a, like media sensation side to naloxone that wasn't really the case. It was it was like nobody had heard of it except for people that had been um, given naloxone by first responders when they when they had overdosed, and. Um, we were doing it kind of under the radar, but it was, it was pretty immediate. I think it was within two weeks of the first um, ampule of naloxone that I ever distributed that somebody came back like on a Thursday site and was like, "Oh my God, I have a story to tell you. You know, we saved somebody's life, and they were really moved by it." And uh, as was uh, as were we, and um, so that was that was pretty that was pretty empowering. I think. Um, for me, as well as for the you know the people that that were being empowered to do the to to reverse overdoses and that they that they witnessed and um, and I can speak to that personally like having revived now probably three people from overdoses um, it's it's not I don't necessarily find it um, empowering in in the way that that you know, just being able to set up a program is, is empowering, but it's like when you consider the other consequences, just if somebody survived, but like you got evicted because you're, you, cause you, cause there was like police activity in your house or, um, they lost brain function because it took that much longer to, um, or the, you know, a harm reduction conference gets shut down because somebody's using and dies. Um, were some of the consequences that we really had to think might have happened, and um, so it it was a really heavy time. Also, you know, because because we had I was there for near misses, and really that so that that was really heavy for me. I think I um decided. After, I decided after a little while to, to leave me. I, I, I think I, I was just um, doing too much and not be, not very well at a, at a certain point is what I felt like. And I was I was wanting to um, I was wanting to do 
more in terms of like feel like there was more outcomes that health outcomes that I could see and and um and you know um I needed some perspective and I also went to um public health school and started started doing that I was, I was kind of wanting to I was like do I on one hand I was like my mission statement was around drug user health and and stuff and I was also like I gotta not pigeonhole myself and and I'm and in fact it's really just been like it's it's really just strengthened my interest in harm reduction in um, combating hepatitis C in and then in working with um, meat again I came back in there there was a a, a, we had a East Bay conference that was that was kind of really cool because conferences almost never happen in the East Bay around. Um, well, conferences when you think of conferences, you think of San Francisco, except for the 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 2006 harm reduction conference was in Oakland, but um, it was yeah 2014. There was a conference that um, Hillary McQuay from Harm Reduction Coalition in Oakland organized, and it was a summit on better health outcomes for drug users. And I met um, Ryan White, who was then the um, sort of board president of, of Need, and um, you know saw some familiar faces, but also um, signed up to you, you know absorb the presentations and saw Diana Silvestri and. And just got to um, sign up to be on some work or be on a naloxone working group, and we were trying to get money for um, for doing a project that would be sort of like supply naloxone to different interested um, parties, not unlike the Dope Project, which is a, um, a naloxone training and distribution outfit that trains trainers and, and sort of does capacity building in San Francisco. Um, that's That was Rachel McLean's idea and Eliza Wheeler has, has executed it. And um, so, and Eliza was one of the people, as, as was David, and um, that was on the, the, it was, you know, went to meetings and we, we were working with the Department of Public Health in Alameda County and that was sort of like we got money but then it went to another program and I sort of and then that but it sent me back to working with need as did I was briefly involved in a statewide um, effort to implement the leg legislation that has been really slow to take effect but where pharmacists can legally sell syringes without a prescription you know with the purpose of preventing um, people from using these needles and so I started showing up at site randomly and seeing all these people I didn't recognize and being like you don't mind if I ask clients a few questions I recognize my participants but I didn't I didn't recognize any of the staff members and um, but uh, folks were very welcoming and and um, David said, you know, there's a, always a place for you if you want to come back. And, and that was like super sweet. I was like, that, that kind of got my juices rolling to be part of Need again. And, um, and so yeah, like I've just kind of been trying to do different projects and try to bring some kind of, I, I guess, I, I, I was always on a learning curve with fundraising like grant writing and so I really admire people that are like really good grant writers but trying to learn to do that better um, and you know other fundraising things are are kind of fun we're gonna be at Folsom Street this year we hope we're gonna find out Monday um, which is that they're, they're really um, amazing in how much um, they they're like do they're expanding their they're philanthropic the the Folsom Street folks and they they um, are expanding their reach of recipients of of their philanthropy to 
harm reduction, and the theme is harm reduction this year. And, this, and so we've been trying to get it, get involved in that. Like it totally makes sense in there. Um, and yeah, we're, we, we have some, I, I think my time's up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> is that what you're saying? <laughs>